Hi, folks. Pastor Mike Spalding here with my good friend and big brother. I am Pastor Casper, and we're here together to encourage you to keep listening to Deception Detection Radio because we're both on this network with our individual shows. Yes, and yes. And we're going to be doing some things together as well. Not just not saying them all. Hey, folks, tune in Deception Detection Radio, some of the best programming in Christian talk, news, encouragement, and Bible studies. God bless you. God bless. Welcome to Shield of the Sun with Michael Kerr. Hello there. Welcome to our Shield of the Sun video. In this video, entitled When the Nephilim Rule the Antidevillian World, this is the subject we are going to be talking about. So let's open this video with an interesting tidbit from history. And this particular event that I'm about to describe to you takes place with a pharaoh who is known as Pharaoh Means. Pharaoh Means was considered to have been one of the most earliest of pharaohs to have ever been known or recorded in history. What is very interesting about this pharaoh is that is how he died basically. He was actually half his body was actually eaten by a very massive hippopotamus that came out of the Nile and attacked them. Pharaoh Means was somebody who used to like to read history to his people. He was an avid sun worshiper, and it is believed that he established some of the very first temples regarding ancient Egyptian sun worship that was derived from an empire before them known as Sumer and ancient Babylon. When Egypt rose to power, or it started to become a major governmental force on the earth, much of its policies were taken from Sumer. Sumer was an empire that fell before them and having a lot to do with the time frame and the events known as the Tower of Babel. What was interesting about Pharaoh Means is he would read to the people historical events that took place in a world that he called the Old World, the Antidevillian world, a world before the flood. Of course, there were Egyptian copetic names for it, and things of this sort. But it's, this is how it's translated into English. And what's interesting about his take on some of these stories is how a lot of them seem to, certain events would correlate with events that were described in the book of Genesis. So you have to understand a few things before I engage the story. Pharaoh means was a worshiper of the sun, meaning he believed that there was a spirit that lived behind the sun and that the spirit had two forms and it was an Andronous spirit. Hence the spirit was worshiped in the form of the sun, the moon, and the spirit also had children of its own. And these children were deities. They were various gods and goddesses that were worshiped. They had various doctrines, various names. There were various gods and goddesses of various elemental matters and things of this sort. They basically had a thousand-page book on their gods and goddesses and many, many volumes and things of this sort. And throughout the ages, the doctrine would change. The, the faith of the way they would perceive their doctrine would change. And within paganism... And the pantheons, ceremonies, and rituals and rites, new traditions would come and go as families would rise to power or lose power and be replaced by other families who have other ideas. So with that being stated, Pharaoh Means used to talk about a place called Atlantis. And what was interesting was some of the brass tacks he would give on that. 
He stated that in the world before the waters came, there was a world where mankind was able to fly, was able to ride the winds, able to ride the waves, able to sail into the deeps. Mankind was able to float into the cosmos, able to disappear to other worlds, able to visit their gods, as he called them. But what he's putting forth to his people, this pharaoh a long time ago, was that before the waters came, there was a world of what we would call advanced technology. He talked about the fact that there were people in this world, people who developed a civilization. And then he talked about another world, a world that was credited as being the beings or the, the immortal ones who created the human race. But of course, as we know, paganism is different from the truth. God stated, or in fact, God has stated over and over again, that he created mankind. God had chosen Moses to write Genesis so that the facts can be known. Because when these ancient rulers described ancient history, they would describe it under the form that they learned from their own gods. In fact, Pharaoh means, and many pharaohs after him, even other rulers in other countries as well who are into paganism, they would often tell you a few things. First, they would tell you that they were touched by the gods, that they were blessed with wisdom by the gods, or they were blessed with knowledge by the gods. So what they're basically telling you is that they have been educated by which the Bible calls Satan. And Satan is pretty good with disinformation. He'll give you some valid information, but it would be covered with a lot of lies. So that being stated, as the story goes, these beings from their world invaded the realm known as Earth. When they invaded, they had seduced this, what they called religious occult. And this religious occult was at odds with other family members. These ones were called the honored family members because they adhered to the sun god and awaited his return to bring revenge upon this sinister religious occult. And they were dubbed as the sons of light. The sons of light were believed to have betrayed the one who gave them, who gives light to all, which they credited as Lucifer. And therefore, in their version of this, the sons of the sun god, who shined brighter as brighter than the light, as they called this, had summoned forth for their gods, and their gods came. When they did, they chose these women among this group, this group who were opposed to the sons of light, to bring forth the honorization of bearing their gods upon this realm, to take them from their realm and to make them physical in our realm. That's how they describe this. Thus forth, these children came forth, and these children were worshipped as gods and goddesses throughout the earth, and they were the champions of the human race. Means goes on to state that the sons of light warred with this tribe and these forces for many centuries until one day they succumbed by the auspiciousness of their lust. And through this, they became on the same wavelength, if you will, or they formed an alliance with the gods that came from the skies. And thus they emulated the behavior of what the Bible would call the fallen angels. So biblically, when we look at the account, what is it describing biblically that we can understand? Fallen angels came to this realm, took human women, and had children. These children were called the Nephilim, meaning those who fall upon others. 
they were noted for being hybrids, being beings made in, to exist in two worlds, having supernatural power. They were called champions of the people, heroes and villains. They were idolized and worshipped by the people. They stunned the people with wondrous powers and abilities. They stunned them by doing things that went beyond their imagination at times. And believe me, their imagination was very vast and very creative at the time, indeed. So as the story goes, these sons of light merged themselves with these fallen angels and served their children, the Nephilim. More wars would take place to the point that the Nephilim eventually took over the entire world. And they took over this empire. It was believed to have been once built by a man they credit as Seth, the same Seth who actually was the son of Adam. But this kingdom, this place that was once built in the honor of righteousness for the glorification of God and housed the intelligence and the resources of mankind, this later kingdom was dubbed Atlantis. And Atlantis, at the end, before the flood came, was being ruled by the Nephilim. Humanity had gave it all away. And when they gave it all away and created these policies that favored these gods and goddesses, as they called them, the gods and goddesses backstabbed them, took it all over, and took over the world, ruling the universe from within it. This is the story the Pharaoh means would present to the people. He would present it in the pagan methodology or the pagan version of the story. For Genesis gives a much clear view of this story. So what we have with this account is that the stories of what means called Atlantis and what others called afterward, there was these files and these books that were then taken and protected by several pharaohs. Up until the point when a phinx was built in Egypt, believed to have been built by the orders of what you know as Joseph in the Bible. And this sphinx housed within one of its paws a secret chamber. It was known as a chamber of books. And within there, this account and others account like it, having more detail with it, were all stored inside the paw of the phinx. And the walls were sealed. And they were closed off, with only very few of the royal families and their descendants knowing how to enter it. But of course, that was centuries ago. And as the Bible tells us, empires come, empires go, and so does the memory of those who were there. They go as well, leaving us only with the tracks that are left behind, which is the archaeology and the study and the research of what can be found. Now, what can be found is an interesting terminology that I've just given to you, because science is all about that. You see, mankind thinks at times within their institutions that they created mathematics or that they created sciences. But the truth of the matter is, mankind did not create mathematics. Mankind discovered it. Mankind did not create sciences. Mankind discovered it. Mathematics and sciences is the universal language that which has been spoken, spoken by one who would have to have one single existence of an all-powerful substance. That one would be God. If anyone created anything, in regards to the scientific nature of what God would be. That means God created mathematics. God created sciences. God created knowledge, wisdom. And all of these things are seen within creation. And in the antediluvian world, they took great advantage of that knowledge that was presented to them. And at first, mankind generally used it for good and stood in the face of this world to preach and to show the glorification of God only to fall very, very hard later on. 
And thus is the story of mankind, is it not? They rise, they fall. And thus Jesus Christ had to come to die for the sins of humanity, to be killed because of our sins by a governmental world who, with their religious institutions, meaning their churches back then, along with their government back then, took Jesus Christ illegally, charged him with things he did not do, crucified him most brutally, sent him up to a hill to die in a place where criminals and thieves are sent, many of them also being crucified for things no man or woman should. So with that being stated, what we have in the past is a rather very interesting indeed. And we're going to look into that particular past. What was it like to live in the anti Davilian world? A lot of you know that NASA likes to cover up things about space, particularly regarding the planet Earth. And a lot of you tend to argue about round or flat, or this way or that way, or maybe even orbitable positions and things of this sort. But I challenge you with this. Why don't we look at the facts of what the Bible has stated and what is actually being covered up? Perhaps a lot of you didn't know this. Did you know that the earth is actually surrounded and it's actually engulfed in a hyperdimensional force field? Did you know that? And that many times when NASA is covering up a lot of the sites that's seen in space through satellites and probes and other probe missions and things of this sort, what is often being shown with that is that the reason why they darken up a lot of what is called space is because the Earth, from the viewpoint of space, is lit up with a lot of lights and a lot of energy and a lot of plasma energy as well. What's interesting about that is that Earth being surrounded by a hyperdimensional field, these fields have openings and circuits and windows and streams that run through it, where only intelligent life would be able to regulate it. What's also interesting is the planets as well. All the planets in our solar system also have a hyperdimensional field that engulfs it. And it even affects the poles of these planets, the north and south poles, and even our own north and south poles, have an unusual high amount of electromagnetic energy, energy that is so powerful and so mysterious, it can pierce and penetrate the physics and the gravity of these planets, including Earth as well. What's also interesting about that is the orbitable positions that cause the spinning of all of these orbs. These orbitable positions are filled with that same electromagnetic energy. And that mathematically, these orbitable positions of all of these planets, including the moons of these planets as well, and including our own, they all have a fixed mathematical regulation to how much energy is released and how much energy is held back. And through this mathematical order, the laws of the universe will then automatically, like a machine, regulate all of these planets and spin them in a way to show that all of the planets by this electromagnetic force are all connected by these hyperdimensional fields. That though Earth is over here and the Moon is over here and Mars is over here, they're all connected by a hyperdimensional field, a field that's from a field that they have for their planets, a field that's within Earth, and then what is called plasma tunnels that connect everything together. And what's interesting about that particular discovery is that in the book of Job, God describes just that, that the universe is held together. The earth hangs on nothing. So what is very interesting about that is that instead of understanding what is 
well, within the apparitions of fake sciences and propaganda and lies, we should take a look more so at what the Bible actually states about the earth and not take verses out of context, but to understand fully what the Bible is teaching. The other thing about the discoveries about the world before the flood is that when we reflect on the account of Pharaoh means, and when we reflect on what Genesis stated, when we even reflect on accounts written in the book of Enoch, and even in accounts in the Psalms, and in the Proverbs, and even in the Gospels, and even in the words of the apostles as well, when these places are described, what often comes up again is this matter of technological sorcery and wonders, and this one aspect, mankind speaking one language, were able to come together, and thus in time, they could utilize gifts wherein what God stated about them to such an extent that nothing would be impossible for them to do. So mankind in the past built up advanced technology. And as we know, the angels themselves are based on a high principle. They're far beyond advanced technology. They could become living advanced technology if they want to. They are made on a higher principle. So therefore, fallen angels, when they came to teach mankind, they didn't come so much as to teach them specific things, meaning things they would have already known. They came to teach them a way of doing things differently from what they've known and to teach them a whole new ideas and an ideology to the gifts they already had. So what is the intent of the fallen angels? Is it to teach you something? Well, obviously not. They don't care about you. The intent is to corrupt you. The intent is to deceive you. The intent is to use you, take advantage of you, backstab you, and get rid of you. And then take over all that you have or that God had given you, including your body as well. That's the intent of the fallen angels. And the intent of their children was the same intent. That's why they're all collectively called demonic in that sense. They're all collectively the hosts of Satan. You have fallen angels, you have demons, but they're all demonic in that parable understanding. Therefore, what we had back in the old world was a place of a fascinating wonder. Archaeology and discoveries have been proving over and over again. And since these people love science so much, maybe they should reflect on this. There is nowhere near any tangible, real, and conclusive and for real, for real, if I should say, anything to really conclude that evolution is nothing more than a theory. In fact, the thought of aliens creating you is also nothing more than a weak theory as well. You coming from monkeys, you coming from aliens, you coming from the sea, you coming from fish, whatever it is, this has no tangible weight to what was actually discovered and what is actually shown time and time again. You can debunk evolution. You can debunk carbon dating. You can debunk aliens created you when it goes back to the same question, then who created the aliens and things of this sort. So obviously, the way they are describing things do not match the laws and what we can see within the universe and the wisdom that's already there. Unfortunately, too many governments didn't want to understand that when they made too many horrible deals with things that they should have been rebuking in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, unfortunately, faith isn't what's on the table when it comes to black operations. So with that being stated, what it has shown time and time again is that all life has an origin, a starting point, and this starting point has an intelligent understanding. This starting point was intelligent. This starting point was alive. This starting point gave 
its intelligence, all that it knew, and it used its awesome, ultimate power to bring life and the mathematical regulations and numbers and letters and balances to create all that these life forms would enjoy within the life that is created. Someone created a world, someone put people in that world, and then someone sealed this world off, and someone is definitely continuing to regulate this world. And this is what science has often shown again and again, while trying to explain it all away, because they don't want you to think about God and what the ramifications all of that really does mean. That it's not their theories that stand. Their theories can't hold weight. It's the Bible that stands. Not only that, but what we find time and time again is that mankind is not evolving. Mankind is degenerating. Mankind used to be bigger and taller and stronger and had more brain capacity back in the past. And they've been reduced over and over and over again to the point that this is what we are today. What has been shown is that mankind, through the book of Genesis, were taught all kinds of sciences and therefore would have easily assessed advanced technology a lot quicker than what we would today. What has also been shown time and time again, that there are buildings, structures, underwater cities, ruins on other planets, advanced technology being found made of a science and made of mathematical principles and engineering and chemical sciences that meant much of it goes well and way beyond the capabilities that we have today regarding those sciences. We don't make buildings like they did. We don't make chemical resources like they did. We don't make metal like they did. We don't make structures and vessels and we don't make colonies and things like that in the manner that they did. Instead, we have to take everything and repackage it. We got to go back from the start and make another version of it. We got to completely rewire it. We are never doing it. But all of our advanced technology today, it doesn't compare to what was found. We're still trying to get there, according to these sciences. So what we have to understand is that in the antedevillian world, you had a time where humanity stood up against Satan, while the family of Cain did not. And then there came a time when that same family, who should have been defending the faith, took upon bad behavior that was seen within the fallen angels and joined them in their rebellion against God. And what we see with this world is that it is a world that held a lot of interesting things. For instance, did you know that the Earth, because it has this intense electromagnetic hyperdimensional field around it, that the Earth can act as its own reactor, really as its own source of energy? And when you tap in to certain power points or equator points along the Earth, meaning the hemisphere seen around Antarctica and the hemisphere seen around northern Africa, locations of Egypt, even North America, and these particular points that are just right underneath the North and South Pole locations. When you think about these areas and the fact that so many pyramids and so many ancient cities are built along these regions, are discovered and found along these regions, when you think about ancient structures all along these regions, and that these structures often shown time and time again that they house forms of advanced electrical power, electrical power that went beyond the understanding of what a lot of people are usually taught when it comes to electricity. And that with these electrical grids that are underneath the earth, mankind and even Nephilim tapped into it, built cities upon it, and constructed stargates. Why? Because they wanted to modulate the weather, to harness the electromagnetic fields that were out in space and infusionate the hyperdimensional sphere so that they can move like the angels and that they too can teleport, transport to other worlds and become stargazers in that 
sense of what they knew and in the technology that they built. The Nephilim were noted for being very cruel rulers indeed, by the way. They would impress people with their technological gifts and show their superiority over mankind. All the things that they took from their fallen angel fathers, even to the point that they would even war on them because they get too big for their britches. They became the masters of the world at the time of the flood. And they would definitely seduce the entire world. They changed the image of humanity. They built wondrous ships, wondrous technological devices. Thousands and thousands of inventions were drowned into the flood. And with that, they took all of mankind's resources, all of which they were, and they remolded it and reshaped it into the images that Satan wanted. They engaged in massive wars out in the universe. Planets fought other planets. Space battles took place. Battles and wars on planets on our earth and throughout even the seas and even in the hollow cores and even in dimensional worlds. Violence, corruption, and all kinds of atrocities were committed. You see, when people think of the propaganda, like Star Trek, in Star Wars. They paint a picture like being on a starship would somehow be great and fun and relaxing. And it's like a luxury cruise through space where sometimes things happen, but most of the time it's a wonderful place to be in. Or like Star Wars where it's adventurous to get shot at with plasma weapons and have your ship exploding and watch whole entire planets and all of their civilizations being blown apart in pieces and somehow we're supposed to feel sorry for people with lightsabers. So when you really think about it, what are these movies telling you? Where do these ideas come from? What are comic books telling you? Considering the fact Stan Lee one time worked for the propaganda department during World War II. So rather interesting indeed, what you can learn in the propaganda department when you work for the government, and then you get released from that to make comic books. It's kind of interesting because Hollywood was said about that again and again, that it's just propaganda. It's stories from the government that is being put within a propaganda form called a movie. Even music had political agendas to it, to endorse the political propagandas of the left or the right. And on and on and on and on it goes. So therefore, you have movies that... Instead of a story, you really have a disinformation story. But what's interesting about that is what they're telling you. Flying through space was not fun. And especially if you have weapons and guns and you're not coming with the word of God or the faith in God. But in Star Trek, it was a new age faith. It was a cultivation of all religions, worshiping themselves and bettering themselves without God. Star Wars was the worship of the forces. The forces are in reference to the religion of witchcraft, which is the religion of who? Satan himself, of Lucifer. Therefore, when they're saying use the force, what you're really saying is, Lucifer, come and help me. And that's really the reality of that. And it all ties in to the things that were discovered in the past. And the, and the ideology that the past had. And this was the ideology of the Nephilim back then. You see, the Nephilim built grand starships and would travel out into space. And then they would encounter other colonies. Other colonies that had a history about it that would fascinate you to know. That the descendants of Adam and Eve went to other worlds. And built up advanced technology and really had to, considering what they were going to be up against, who was Satan. See, there's this history you're not told. And there are things that you should understand. But instead of being learning those deeper, wonderful truths of your real history, instead, you get movies and music and you get evolution and theories and aliens and X-Files and Independence Day. So that all of us who have to be called by God to tell you things that your churches failed to tell you, 
can look crazy and get persecuted while everyone else can go on and collect their little checks and their tax breaks and take it easy in life. Well, they can't even be men in their own home, many of them. Rather interesting world you're in, isn't it? See, in the anti devilian world, it was no different. Why would Satan attack women and get them to breed children and get them to seduce all these families? Because it's divide and conquer, people. And so, back in the anti devilian world, when they would use the force in that sense, it wasn't fascinating to watch. It wasn't, ooh, here comes the good part, or anything of that sort. Instead, when the people had to see their rulers and these supernatural beings proverbially use the force, they ran for their lives, grabbing their children and whatever they can, and were screaming in terror at what was to follow next, which was them being burnt alive and tortured and incinerated and cut into pieces and having their heads taken off and things that you just can't really describe here because it's just too gross. When the Nephilim showed up in a starship, it wasn't like Captain Kirk coming down and everyone's fascinated by what Mr. Spock has to say. No, nobody was going to them in awe, going, ooh, nice uniform. Everybody was running away in terror in the opposite direction because what they would see is plasma burst and energy burst firing upon their cities and blowing everything apart and everybody was running and scattering for their lives. That's what they would see. You see, when people went out into space, usually it wasn't, wow, what a fascinating adventure I'm on. They were usually a nervous wreck and they couldn't wait to get back home. You see, there's reality when it comes to all of this science fiction, as you call it. But the reality isn't fun and exciting. You shouldn't get excited to find ruins and things on other planets to the point where you can't wait to talk to E.T., in fact, the whole concept of E.T., back in the 1980s when Steven Spielberg produced this awful movie, it was one time shown in the White House, actually, when Ronald Reagan was president. After the movie, Ronald Reagan got up, looked at the crowd, basically the people there at the time who were watching this movie in the White House, and told them, so many things in this movie are so many things that all of, many of you in this room know all too well about. And he walked out. That's what he had to say. And what's interesting about that is that what Reagan was one of those people who was more willing to want to talk about it, but couldn't. And just couldn't understand why the military department and the parameters of intelligence would classify something that was so overwhelming that people eventually are going to know about it. And they should at least know honestly from their government now. But people disagreed with him to such a point that they just got tired of everything else he was doing and they tried to kill him. Another guy who wanted to talk about it was JFK. We all know what happened to him, right? But did you know there were guys before that? There was James Forrestal. He wanted to talk about it too. He wanted to tell you what happened at Roswell. He ends up mysteriously throwing himself out of a window. And there's a lot of other people we can go to as well. We could talk about Bill Cooper, who just mysteriously gets shot up by the FBI in front of his house. We could talk about other people as well. Maybe one day I'll just step out of this house and just some magical thing just blew my head off. Yeah, we don't know. Maybe he committed suicide. Maybe the rocks fell down on him. Who knows? It's an interesting thing indeed, isn't it? But this is a suppression that we're dealing with. The suppression of the truth that took place in the past. The truth. It is very hard for people to want to understand and know. It is a truth that much of what you call science fiction was the reality of yesterday. And that reality wasn't pleasant and fun. It was a violent world filled with every single thought that was corrupted all the time. Imaginations ran evil all the time. They weren't enlightened. They weren't discovering new worlds. They weren't fascinated by the, the internal elemental force that existed around them. Nothing like that. Even though they were seeing everything like that, they weren't feeling any of it. 
you get my meaning? They wanted this world to end, many of them, because it was so horrible. It was a world that favored the strong and destroyed all that were below them. Nobody was safe. Toward the end, on that day when the waters hit, barely anyone had any rights, and most of the population had already wiped themselves out due to wars. So don't think that the flood had killed billions and billions and billions of people. The picture is that there is no doubt at least over a billion people died. There's no doubt about that. But the population mostly destroyed themselves. Most of the population, a large part of it, was wiped out before the flood because of all these wars they constantly were afflicting each other with. When the flood came, the billions that were left were just taken out because it was just a disgusting sight to see over time. There was only eight people that were untainted from the rest of the world, and you know who they were, and they got saved in the ark that, they were, that God commanded them to build, which was a ship that can board the waters and endure the effects of the flood, which God had to supernaturally protect overall. And the world before the flood was an interesting place indeed. It is a world that started off with great potential. It started off with great opportunities. It could have lasted to this day. The flood really didn't have to come. But it came because those who were the guardians of that world betrayed the one true God who created them and made them who they were. Fallen angels who were supposed to honor God, love God, and worship God went to war with his angels and were casted out from their home. They brought questions down here, and humanity, unfortunately, gave them room for those questions to have validation, leading to the dispensation of mercy and grace, leading us to have to learn lessons the hard way. And unfortunately, when governments force it, the outcomes are very hard indeed. It is usually the outcome of the destruction of your power and the recycling of another, until one day there's nothing more to recycle. God destroyed this world one time with water. Water that came through the hyperdimensional spheres and literally fried everything and flooded this planet and affected the universe around it, causing a universal catalysm on other planets as the flood raged across. These were waters that did not come from the earth, by the way. They were supernatural waters with powers of its own, able to do things that would baffle your mind. Read more about that if you doubt it. Read the totality and understand the science of the destruction that the flood actually caused. That one event causing a series of other events. It's rather interesting indeed, if you want to be so inclined to know, and you should know, because it's going to be very important to know down the road. Even the way you see time, past, present, and future, there are things about time that would really baffle your mind, that would really send you for one. In fact, explaining the nature of time, explaining the nature of the universe you're in, that you're in a simulated world. Did you know that? It's not like the Matrix, but it has similarities to it. One day you die and you wake up somewhere else and you realize some things that are going to really surprise you. And this is why there's no pain in that world, because the reality becomes too clear to you, and you have nothing more to cry for when you're in that world. But to get to that world on good terms, you need Jesus Christ, and you need to accept what the Bible stated. Because there was a group of men who were one time far more smarter than all of you, far more smarter than all these government leaders combined, it's far more smarter than all the scientists around the world combined. They were advanced beyond us, but yet we're human, like then we're human. Our ancestors is who I speak about. Our true ancestors, the descendants of Adam and Eve, and not the descendants of a monkey or a reptile. So with that being stated, they knew all of these things that I know and knew it even more so. But yet the day they decided to put the word on the shelf and not take it seriously and do things their own way, that was the day the fallen angels had them and policy was created 
that led to the destruction of everything. Mankind is not perfect, no matter what age or period of time they come from. There are lessons that were taught in the past that will be taught in the future. The world was destroyed once by water, and then this time it will be destroyed by fire. And when Jesus Christ comes, it is not going to be a wonderful day for the world, by the way. It'll be a terrible day for the world because the world will be destroyed and every sinner in it will be incinerated and eradicated from existence. But before that, you will pay forever for everything you've done. Why get within the knowledge of what hell is like, what execution is like? Why understand all of that and understand it for all the time that you will have to understand it. When you can just take the easy way and accept the sacrifice and the way that Jesus Christ offers. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself. All you have to do is walk in the way. He did the hard part. He only offers you the light burden. The world puts burdens upon you that they themselves are not willing to carry. Your hard burdens do not come from God, but it comes from a hypocritical, selfish world who denies the realities of the past only to repeat the mistakes of the past. With that being stated, join me in a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, that mankind learn from their mistakes, that we as the sons and daughters of God, that we learn from our mistakes as well. Cast out witchcraft, bigotry, and government policies that tie in with satanic policies and cast out the demons of the waters, the air, and all that which exists throughout the universe that insidiates itself into the affairs of humanity. May they be exposed, may they be rebuked. Protect the people as the government seeks to work against them, using lies and using deception and using two-sided methodologies, not to endorse your word or glorify your name, but to send fear and hatred and misery within the people. Deliver this spirit of rivery. Save the children being held in cages, held for sacrifices in terrible, terrible situations. Save all of humanity from evil. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. If you'd like to donate to Shield of the Sun, please go to www.gofundme.com. There at GoFundMe.com, please donate to the page called Michael Herb Books and Education. You can also click the link below at the end of this video to go straight to the page. If you don't see it right away at the end of this video, it will be up. Just go to the next video where you can click it there. I want to say God bless you all. Please remember to donate because we are having a lot of struggles as of late. So we really do need your help. God bless you to all, and I will see you next video. From London to Taiwan I've been all around the globe Trying to protect your soul